He knows his anger issues. He's not violent in any way, just his tone, and he's just, you know, he's a big guy, and when he screams, it makes you nervous, you know? I want to reframe that. That's violence. And men are, can be, especially men, can be very tactful in their use of violence. What up, what up? This is John with the Dr. John Deloney Show. So grateful that you've joined us. Talking about mental health, marriages, emotional health, parenting, whatever's going on in your world. I'm here for it. Been doing this for 20 years, sitting with people who are, the wheels are falling, more than 20 years now, good grief, I'm getting old, man. The wheels have fallen off and it's just, something is so annoying, something is so frustrating or something is dire. And man, in this culture we've built for ourselves, we are lonely, lonely, lonely. And I'm always honored when people reach out and say, hey, can you help? And I mean, I have the right answer, man, but I promise I'll sit with you and listen and we'll figure it out together. If you want to be on this show, go to johndeloney.com slash ask, A-S-K, and fill out the form or go to, uh, uh, give me a buzz at 1-844-693-3291. If you are younger than 35, I don't know if you know that you can actually um, punch numbers into that little box that you carry around with you and talk to other people, which is rad. Um but nobody's going to answer the phone. If you call, you can just leave a message and uh, then somebody will call you back. It's pretty pretty cool, this uh, phone technology. Um, we're getting to the end of the pre-sales se- season. If you have thought like, oh, I think I'm going to pre- pre-order this book, please, today's the day. Make it happen. Go to johndeloney.com, pre-order, building a non-anxious life. It's breaking all kinds of pre-order records in this building. It's ex- I'm, I'm excited to have it out. Um, and the stores that are reading it and picking it up, it, it's just kind of, it's developed a momentum of its own, which is, is just, it's, it's super exciting. Um, and if you order it before it comes out, it'll comes with the free audiobook. If you're an audiobook person, um, we're autographing some of them and I don't know how that goes, but that'll be on the website. And it also comes with the digital copy and a couple other things. So please go check it out go to johndeloney.com and grab your copy. Let's go out to Orlando, Florida, and talk to dear Marie. What's up, Marie? Hi there. Hi there. What's Hi, up? Thanks for having me, Dr. John. Of course. <laughs> thank you for calling. What's happening? So I've been married. I've been with my husband for 30 years, married 28. Um, we're, you know, we're younger, you know, 50s. We had our kids early. They're out of the house. Um, but the, the question is, so he has anxiety. He takes... Um, like anxiety medication, but for the most part, he just snaps off. Like he just yells and gets at me or whatever the situation is. He gets frustrated easily. Um, It's been going on our entire marriage. I've just learned to push it under the rug and figure it wasn't me. It wasn't about me. And, you know, that he just has anxiety issues. Well, it's starting to get, you know, it's getting to me again. And, you know, and I just don't know kind of the direction we should go. We've had talks about it. Um, he understands, he knows his anger issues. He's not violent in any way, just his tone. And he's just, you know, he's a big guy. And when he screams, it makes you nervous. You know, I want to reframe that that's violence and men are, can be, especially men, women too, but especially men can be very tactful in their use of violence. And what I mean by that is they can shut your nervous system down. They can make your whole body feel unsafe to be in your home as though they punched you in the face and they never lay a finger on you. And oh. that's part of the insidious nature of it. When he, If he's screaming and yelling, he's a big guy and he's hollering and throwing stuff and getting mad at you for whatever. Um, yeah, that's every bit violence. That is every bit violence. And Yeah, uh, he's, not, he's not where he doesn't throw things or nothing like that or he's not like physically violent. Mm-hmm. But yeah, he, the tone and the screaming, and he's just aggravated at traffic, at people, at me. You know, it's just like, and it goes in waves. You know, some days he's just a, you know, for months he's the nicest person in the world. He'll do anything for you. Why is he, you know, why, it, aggravated. It, it's hard because he's not on the phone, but you said y'all have talked about this. Why does he choose to live in misery like this? He, I don't know. He, he just, he says, I don't know what's wrong with me. I don't know why I get so impatient and snap off and. You know, I'm very short. But why has that not been a lifelong, I'm going to, I'm going to go down the rabbit hole and figure this out because I yeah. love this woman so much that she doesn't deserve this. Right. And by the way, I he love myself it. so much. I don't want to have a stroke, right? I don't want to die young. Right. Yeah. I mean, verbally, he says he knows he has a problem. He has anger issues. He, so he tries to medicate it. 
you know, like with uh, Zoloft or he's on something different now. And Zoloft almost gave him no personality. Mm-hmm. And then what he's on now, it's not enough. And I, I think he needs some kind of therapy. He needs to go to maybe cognitive therapy or... He, I'll like tell you chemistry. right now, he needs 1,000% needs therapy. He needs to go see somebody. 1 million yeah. percent. You can't make him do that, though. He verbally told me he would. Yeah, and but this, he won't. This happened two he's weeks been, ago, but he still hasn't made an appointment with He's not going to. He's not going to. He yeah, hasn't. He blames that he can't get through to anyone. Yeah, that's nonsense. <laughs> he has chosen not to. In fact, I'll call his bluff. I'm going to give you three months of free better help at the end of this call. And so I'll give you a code for free therapy that they will call you back and he will be in contact with a the therapist within 24 hours. Oh, wow. And he can do it from Thank his you. computer. He won't do it, but I'm just telling you, I've, I'll call that bluff. Okay? okay. Wow. But he's not on the phone. The no. bigger thing is no. you. So I want, okay. I want to separate a few things for you. Number one, if you've ever listened to this show, I say this all the time, behavior is a language. I yeah. rarely care what people say. I want to know what they do. So he can say, I know, and I shouldn't be doing this, and I'm really working on it. You're not. He's not. Right. He is, he's absolutely not because his, his, language, his behavior is telling you everything he needs to know. That he would rather sit in his anger and misery than have a marriage worth living for. He would rather feel empowered and encapsulated in a safe little bubble behind this anger and rage then be exposed and vulnerable, which is the only path towards true intimacy and connection. Right. That's the choice he's making. So, yeah. cool. You, though, can only control you. And so for the right. millions and millions of millions of people out there who are roommates with their husband or wife, who are just wondering every day, what is it about me? Why, why does he not like me? Why does she not like me so, so deeply? You have to ask yourself those questions. What is the language that your behavior is communicating? So I'll ask you, have you been to see somebody? No. Now it's time because you're living an abusive marriage. Have, do you have a group of women that you reach out to and, just, and you plug in with once a week, once every two weeks? Yeah, I have a good core group of friends. Okay, what yeah, do they say about talk. it? Well, most of them are divorced. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, yeah, this is the way this is. <laughs> They're like, they're, they say the same thing that I'm an abusive marriage, you know, and I know there's a thing is mental abuse, physical abuse. He's never cursed at me, told me I was awful or a loser or anything like that. Doesn't matter. You know, he's never used that kind of language, right? You're, you're just, making excuses for him. Home. Yeah, I know I am. You don't need yeah. him. To, he doesn't need you to protect him. He's doing a great job protecting himself. Right. I, I think in protecting him, you're actually protecting yourself because if you actually felt if you actually truly sat in how freaking lonely you are, I bet it would take your breath away. Is that fair? Yep. Yeah. I'm so sorry. sorry. No, don't be sorry. I'm heartbroken for you. Yeah, it's hard because I do love them. You know, know, we are, you know, we're we're physically attracted to each other and I make those excuses for that. And I'm like, well, the times that he's good, he's great. And then oh. when he goes down that rabbit hole, like you say, you know, I'm like, oh, there he is. There's a little, you know, demon showing and, himself. And, and what you don't realize, maybe you realize that. That's not fair. Maybe you do. Most people don't. Realize is that your body sets off to protect you even during the good times. So even right. the good times, you're not fully plugged into each other because there's still a part of your body that would be failing you if it wasn't on guard. It's true. And so it's like hugging somebody with one arm. You can hug them tight, but it's not all the way. Right. And so I think the conversation has to eventually do one of two things. Step one is, um, and I, I don't think this is the path, but I'm never going to take this option from somebody. Um, in a violent one, I'll, I'll make phone calls. In this situation, I, I can tell you, just as your friend, I mean, if this is what you've made peace with. This is what you've made peace with. And if he just starts yelling and you choose to leave and go sleep in a hotel until he quits being a, acting like a four-year-old, um, then cool. I hope that's not what you cash out and choose to live. No. The other, the other piece is, 
is you sitting down somewhere in a neutral location, not in your home, but somewhere where you look across a table and you've probably written this down in a form of a letter so that you can read it and because it's going to be emotional, it's going to be heavy. And you look at him and say, I'm so lonely, I can't breathe. And you scare me and you've scared me for 30 years. And I'm scared of my own home and it has to end now. No more excuses. Either you have the courage to leave me, husband, or you have the courage to go get well. But I can't be scared and terrified of my own home anymore by the man that I love more than anybody else. Yeah. That's it. That's perfect. But here, hold on. It's perfect, but it's scary because he might say, I'm not yeah. going to counseling. I'm just not. You know who you married. It's been this way for 20 years, whatever crap he wants to throw. And then you have to make a hard call. The or what decision or what you're going to go. Well, I tried. It's cool. Yeah. Well, are you going to move in with one of your divorced friends for 30 days? I mean, you're going to have to have that conversation. Right. What was the, what would be the next decision or step? That's up. That's up to you. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. That's what I mean. I'd have to come to come to Jesus with that. You know. I think Jesus has come to you. I think yeah. the re- what happened that 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 inspired this call. Usually, something happened. Um, a friends of ours. We were on a trip, and some friends friends finally saw the real Nick, and I saw it, and I was humiliated. You know, the way he talked to them, he exploded on them because they were talking about how he's driving and just ridiculous stuff. We couldn't make a decision on a restaurant. He just yelled at everyone. And I just sat there and like total embarrassment. Sure. And that, you know, and it was just like the final, oh my God, someone else finally saw this. Was he embarrassed? (laughs) He apologized later. He was, he, he apologized for embarrassing me, but I don't think he was embarrassed. He didn't say he was, he just he was sorry that he embarrassed me and then he felt terrible for that and that he would do therapy he said he would but that was two weeks ago mm-hmm. you know and i haven't brought it up just letting him figure but that, it out but that's always been your move and he doesn't figure yeah. it out and he won't figure it out he You're won't right. <laughs> it never will yeah yeah and so you you choosing to be neutral Right on a in, in a burning house, you 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 go down in flames. Yeah, and, and that's it's, interesting you said that because in neutral, because in my business life, I'm in total control. Of course, you are. But in my personal life, I'm, I've I've like let that. I'm like, eh. This is abuse. Don't deal with it. It's what it does yeah. to us. It's what it does. The number of people I've met with over the years that are bulldogs in their professional life. And just get beat up one side up down the other at home. It's super common. Because here's why. At work, we feel very competent in what we do, especially as we move up the ladder and as our business grows or our profession, our professional status grows. We feel, we feel um, competent. We feel confident because we have a series of little wins underneath us that we, that we stand upon. I know I can do this. At home... We are haunted by that terrifying, scary little question. Do you love me? And that is a whole different skill set. That's a different part of your brain. That's a different everything. And you are terrified of the answer to that question because you get the answer every day. Y'all just don't want to own it. And the answer is he would rather act like a child, act like a baby, scream, yell, kick, shake his baby rattle than he would provide a safe, warm home for his wife. Yeah. And after 30 years, I can't imagine that level of pain. Yeah. It's exhausting, frustrating. I have a picture of like a doghouse in my head. And he's inside <laughs> it, just breathing really heavy in there, kind of half asleep. And you're chained to a little stake outside that doghouse. And you don't have to go in there. But you can't, you, you're not letting yourself go anywhere else. Oh, yeah. And you've made peace out there. You're really kind when the neighbors walk by to pat you on the head. And you curl up. Sometimes a neighbor's kid will come play with the toys and really good. And you're good at sitting and doing all the rules at work. But that breathing, that, that, that 
growl is still there right behind you inside that dark doghouse. And the t- crazy part is, is that uh, chain is not even hooked up. Right. It's not. The mental chain. It is. So for whatever it's worth, hear me say this. You are worth more than the life you're living right now. He is too. And if he wants to call my show, I would love to talk to him. But he's not here, so I can only talk to you. You have to go call a counselor and saying, I'm going to go talk to somebody. You have to write down in the form of a letter what you actually feel. I am sick and tired of being scared in my own home. Haunted and terrified by the man who I love so much. I'm tired of you scaring our friends. I'm tired that our kids don't want to be in this house because they don't know what version of you they're going to get. And most importantly, I'm tired of watching the man I love kill himself slowly. In the nerd world, we call it long tail suicide. A slow, angry, raged out, distracted suicide. non-engagement can't be an option anymore unless that's just the way you're gonna roll dude i hope i hope you look in the mirror and realize that marie from orlando is worth more than that i can't give that to you hang on the line we're gonna hook you up with better help and we're gonna call his bluff and um i'm gonna send you a copy of building a non-anxious life i'm also gonna send you a copy of own your past change your future i think that's a book that you would get some great benefit out about living in traumatic situations and these stories that keep us chained and then asking that scary question, what are we going to do next? Um, So I'm going to send you both of them. I'm going to hook you up. Anything you need, call me back. I'll walk with you. But this is going to take a drastic snow globe shakeup for anything new to happen in this marriage. And I think that's going to be up to you. We'll be right back. This episode is sponsored by BetterHelp. Hey, this is Deloney. I hope y'all are doing well. Listen, Sometimes it's hard to get our brains to turn off, and I know what I'm talking about. I am the king of racing thoughts. They've kept me up at night, they've got me up early, and kept me from connecting with people I love. If you find your thoughts start to race right before bed or during other super inconvenient times, a great way to make those racing thoughts slow down or stop is to talk them through. And therapy gave me a place to do that so I could get off the negative thought treadmill, learn positive coping skills, set healthy boundaries, and find some mental and emotional peace. And it can help you too. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. BetterHelp is convenient because it's entirely online, so it's flexible and can fit into your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist, and you can even switch therapists at any time for no extra charge. So take a break from racing thoughts with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash Deloney today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash Deloney. All right, let's go out to Denver, Colorado and talk to Joe. What's up, Joe? Hey, Dr. Delaney. First time uh, caller. I'm glad to, and honored to talk to you today. Dude, I'm honored that you called, man. What's up? So um, my question is, and I can explain the backstory. Am I crazy for thinking that my wife can use her anxiety disorder as a weapon against me? <laughs> as somebody who was once diagnosed with an anxiety disorder, no, they make extraordinary weapons. <laughs> like, give me, give me your, give me your, uh, your backstory. Okay. So I've been married a little over a year and, um, I didn't know about my wife's, um, anxiety disorder. Um, the first time we were together, we were together about a year and a half. We split up and then COVID happened and we got back together a year later. We got engaged a year later, we got married and here we are. Um, I didn't know about my wife's anxiety disorder the first time we went out. And, um, before she was with me, um, she was with a person who was very verbally abusive that brought out her anxiety from her childhood that got worse and worse. Um, ever since we got engaged into married, it comes out a little more and more, the longer that we're together. Um, and it, it shows in weird ways. Um, 
right now, my major issue that I have is uh, my uh, my wife spends a lot of money on mobile applications um, on her phone that she says helps her anxiety. It's bull crap it on a stick. Absolutely bull crap on a stick. Makes it 10 times worse, 100 times worse. Yeah. So when she was with her ex, her common thing would be to drive around the metro area that I live in for an hour to two hours till she was able to calm down and sleep. That was her anxiety coping mechanism. And now it's, it's this, um, it's gotten to a really bad point. Um, so just to give you a parameter, it's been about a thousand dollars in this calendar year, which on games, like on, on phone games. Yes. So like, if you imagine like, um, that's 1000 more dollars than I've ever spent on a mobile game. (laughs) (laughs) Wow. So I'll, I'll look at my credit card statement and I'll just see, I won't name the developer. I don't want to insult them on your show, but I'll just see like constant work, like items on here. And I suffer from financial anxiety. Um, having a lack or something like uh, an overdraft causes me to have a visceral reaction because I never had that before I was with my partner. I never overdrafted my checking account. Um, and I, I knew exactly how much money was in my checking account at all times. So being with my, my partner now, she's exactly the opposite. And <laughs> she spends money on this, on that, and it, it's just, um, I, I I don't know, I, I can't get her to budget. I've tried that route. <laughs> Actually, hold on, hold on. Let, me, uh, let me hop in here, let me hop in here, yeah. okay? So, first and foremost, cancel that credit card immediately, today, okay? Okay. Um, this is gonna get out of control in a wild way, and I'd be willing to bet money may be wrong, but I'd be willing to bet money, no no pun intended here, um, that this is not the only thing she's spending money on. Yeah. There's no possible way this is the only thing. And this is one of those moments that people find out like it was a thousand bucks, it was eighteen hundred dollars, suddenly it's twenty five thousand bucks and it's you're talking a couple of years to recover from it. I would cancel that card today. Mm-hmm. This is you stopping the bleeding of somebody you love right in front of you. And they may say, ouch, this hurts. I hate this. Get your hands off me. I'm not going to let you bleed out in front of me. Okay? That's what that move is. All right? Backing out. Listen to me super clear and super careful, okay? All anxiety is is an alarm system for your body, period. It is not a driver of behavior. It doesn't make you do things you don't want to do. It doesn't force you into other behaviors, X, Y, Z, fill in the blank. I'll even go one step further. She chose to remain in that relationship with that guy. And not to undermine abusive relationships, man. I've I've sat with people forever in in those situations. They're brutal and ugly. That guy didn't didn't make her anxiety worse. Her body was screaming at her to get out of the situation and she stayed. And it got louder and it got louder and it got louder. And so I don't want to demonize anxiety. I don't want to live in a house without a smoke detector. That's insane, right? What I want to do is begin to ask, what about this life? What about this ecosystem that this body lives in, that this person lives in, your wife or your, your friend or whoever, or you, what is it about this ecosystem that my body keeps telling me we're not safe, we're not safe, we're not safe, we're not safe? Because most people spend all their time trying to shut the alarm off instead of dealing with the fire. Okay. So number two, and any sort of diagnosis is a context, not an excuse. I had, was diagnosed at one point with OCD. I had anxiety, all those things. Fine. I still had to show up at work. And I get distracted counting things and I have to check my locks a bunch. Okay, great. That means I got to get up 15 minutes earlier or five minutes earlier or two minutes earlier. That means I have to be really, really particular about how I exercise, how I reach out to friends and community, how I take care of my body, et cetera. And by the way, I I don't make any laps around my house much anymore. It's gone. So to say like I have to do this because is completely opposite. In fact, it strengthens it. Number three, here's the gnarly thing about anxiety. 
in her case, something is setting that trigger off. And I have a feeling I know what it is, and you're not going to like it, but I'll tell you in just a second. It sets that alarm off to which she immediately runs to a numbing, um, a numbing behavior. Well, that's driving around for two hours, listening to sad songs, listening to Olivia Rodriguez and singing and singing. Or it is her sitting in a bathroom with the door locked on video games, on her phone. Whatever it is, it's a numbing behavior. Here's the problem. Her brain won. Her brain sounded an alarm for her to avoid a situation that it just deemed a threat, whether that's loneliness, whether that's a scary romantic partner, whether that's any number of things, financial stress, whatever it is. And when she goes to a numbing behavior, the body goes, ah, we avoided it. And it puts a GPS pin in that move. This one works. Do it louder next time. And so the only way to heal from anxiety, the only way to deal with those alarms is to run directly towards them. That's it. And I don't mean that in some woo-woo fluffy way. I mean directly at them. Like, so in your case, why am I so, why does my body try to get my attention every time there's a dollar missing in my account? The reason I had financial anxiety, if you will, that's not even a diagnostic, but I get stressed out. Money was so contentious. We didn't have any growing up. It was scary. And it also, my dad was a policeman and my community didn't pay him enough to give us groceries. And I remember resenting that, but it was all wound up in that. And so I went and borrowed six figures worth of student loans and cars and houses and all this crap so that I could not be that. And I ended up in a bigger hole than my old man ever was in. And so my body was letting me know, you're not safe, you're not safe, you're not safe, you're not safe. You see what I'm saying? So anxiety is not the bad guy here. This world is. Now, when you say you have anxiety, anxiousness, what often happens when somebody is, their body is responding anxiously, they partner up with another anxious person. And that electricity feeds that electricity, which feeds that electricity. And suddenly you get two radioactive people sharing a bed together and it's combustible. So are you an anxious guy too, or a very particular guy? Or a very, I don't want to say OCD in the clinical sense, but a very, everything's got to be in order kind of guy? I'm very analytical, yes. <laughs> <laughs> analytical. What a positive spin. Well done. Um, how long has she struggled with this anxiety? Um, for about five years, uh, which would be about the time she was with the ex. I would be um, willing to bet my car, it's not a nice one, that it's been going on way longer than that. Yeah. If she traced it back to when she was a kid. That'd be she, my guess. She was adopted. Okay. She was adopted and she doesn't, her birth mom is not um, there in the head. Um, would probably be the two sheets to the wind would probably be a good way of describing her mother's um, mental acuity. She's not. Yeah. She's struggling. What about her? Anyway, it, we can go down that road. We don't have to do that right now. Um, I'll give you the line that snapped me out of it. Here's a direct quote from my wife. This is about 12 years ago now. She said in a very quiet, calm manner, I am watching the man I love die. And I can't sit here and watch that. Will you please go talk to somebody? And my numbing behaviors, Joe, were work. My numbing behaviors were... Um, reading journal articles and creating these big maps of I could figure out how people worked. My numbing things were watching stand-up comedians and like I had notebooks where I was charting out which jokes were funny and how long they took between jokes. It was insane. Everybody's got different numbing things, but my wife sat down and said, I'm watching you die. and I love you too much. And it was that moment that I've, finally felt somebody loved me so much that they weren't interested in what I was in all this peripheral stuff. They were just watching me drown mm -hmm. and it, I burned them every time they reached in to help. So I went and got help. Yeah, and I think that's a lot of it. <laughs> it is, but you trying to solve the alarm systems will not work. They will just reinforce them because her body will tell her, hey, he doesn't see the threat. Let's ring this sucker even louder. He can't hear these things. 
And every time you go to the periphery and say, hey, you need to stop doing this, she's going to move to another. Either her body's going to accept that as rejection, which is a cornerstone of an anxious body is a lack of connection, um, which is weird because you're like, we're married. We're right here. We sleep together. We sleep in the same bed. But her body is saying, not safe, not safe, not safe. And so the path forward here is, I'm going to provide a safe place for you and me. And that safe place starts with me telling you, I love you so much, I can't watch you, I can't watch you die. I can't watch you numb your life out. You're worth more than a numbed out life. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Is, that, is that ringing, is any of this ringing true to your home? Yeah, I... I mean, I, I hope she never dies off of mobile apps and her anxiety. I just. It's not I, that. I, I love her a lot. I know, Joe, but I, it, it's not about the oh, mobile apps. Because I promise you, I promise you, and you know this, you're married to a taser. Yeah. And this is just one of 15 different numbing things. But I'll tell you, it escalates and it moves. And it goes from mobile apps to. Um, some guy who really thinks she's cute and funny at work who sends one funny emoji that she responds to with one funny emoji. It goes to one more drink. It goes to, I'm just going to go to bed early. Mm. And I've just done this for too long. It's not about the mobile apps. It's about watching your wife feel like she has to hide from her own life because she can't handle how intense it is. And it feels like I got to run away from that intensity. And the only way to heal is to run directly into it. Most of us can't do that by ourselves. You got to call a professional and get some help. You got to go see a counselor and say, I'm tired of being this exhausted. My husband told me he loves me so much and he's watching me slowly drain out of my own life. And I want to stop that. I'm going to send you both. I'm going to send you a copy of Building a Non-Anxious Life, and I want you all to go through that book together. I'll give you a roadmap, or at least give you all some questions to ask yourself inside your own home to begin to say, okay, why are these alarms ringing all the time in here? And you, my friend, need to ask those questions too because I think they're ringing off in your life too. You've just chosen to, to try to handle them by being very analytical. I've tried to handle them by ignoring them. Both strategies are pathological to their extremes. But I want you all to read this book together and start looking at each one of these pieces. And if you get to a piece you can't dig into, that's when you call a counselor and say, well, I need some help here. I've got high hopes for your marriage because mine is, is as good as they come. And I had a partner that stuck with me. She kept calling me out and kept saying, I miss you. Where are you? Where are you? And then I went and did the work. Y'all can too. I promise. We'll be right back. What's up, friends? Dr. John Deloney here. And I want to let you in on a secret that most people didn't tell you before you got married. Honesty and intimacy take practice. They don't just happen. You got to put the reps in. And a beautiful weekend away in Nashville, Tennessee is a great way to do just that. So join me and Rachel Cruz right here at the Ramsey Event Center for a money and marriage getaway. You'll learn how to have healthy conversations around money, boundaries, and even sex and intimacy in your marriage. Plus, we're going to have an incredible great time. This weekend is for couples in every season of life, and engaged couples are welcome too. But it's coming up fast, October 19th through the 21st. It's a three-day retreat. The cost is $799, but you can take $100 off when you use the code Deloney at checkout. That's three incredible days for you and your spouse for just $699. Go to RamseySolutions.com slash getaway today. That's RamseySolutions.com slash getaway. All right, we're back. Let's go out to Kaylin in Columbus, Ohio. What's up, Kaylin? <laughs> Hi, how are you? Doing great. How about you? I'm um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> What's up? How can I help? <laughs> oh, I talked to you a few weeks ago, um, and you told me I could call back whenever and kind of tell you what's going on. And oh no, did I give you? Did happened. I give you bad advice? No, no, no. It has nothing. It has really. It's almost not connected to that at all. To be honest. Okay. Um, all right. Cool. Well, so what's up? Yeah. 
Okay. So my question is, how can I support my spouse in the aftermath of my mental health crisis? Give me some more context. What happened? Oh, um, so almost three weeks ago, so like just a couple days after I talked to you last time, um, I was admitted to a psychiatric crisis stabilization hospital on an involuntary 72-hour hold. Oh, man. Did, um, uh, that means you were acutely suicidal. What happened? I, yeah, I just didn't want to be alive anymore. Yeah. Um, they, I'd been depressed for a while this summer. And so my doctor increased the medication I was on. And I think it was the wrong medication for my body because a week after the medication, everything just got like a hundred times worse. Yeah. And it just felt like I was in a hole that I could never crawl out of. So I went to the hospital. I've actually heard and- it. I've actually heard it the other way, um, where, when they ratchet up your meds a lot in, in an mm-hmm. acute setting, it actually takes somebody who's in a black hole and gives them just enough gumption to cash out. Yeah. That, you see what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Instead of pulling it deeper down the rabbit hole, it actually pulls you up where you can see just a little bit. I can just reach to the top of the counter to go ahead and, and get off this train. Yeah. So things are bad. Yeah. Um, Let's back out. Why why did you call the show originally? The first time? Mm -hmm. um, About my mom asking me for money. Okay. And feeling like resentful towards her. So, yeah, it's not really directly related to that. Well, but I mean, I'm just trying to get a context for your depression, but that's not really why you're calling. So let's get get to, yeah, your call. So number one, I'm so, so glad that you're alive. Thank you. Are you? Most of the time. <laughs> okay. I'll take that as a win right now. Yeah. Um, um, do you, th- I, I know when you're sitting in the black hole and you feel tired and you feel like yeah. I'm out. Do you also feel like people would be better off without you around? Yeah. I'm going to, uh, yeah, and I have, like, more context for that. Okay, tell too. me more about that. Um, so, especially after um, coming home from the hospital, um, things have just been, like, crazy. Um, when I was in the hospital, my mom wanted to see me, and I didn't want to see her mm-hmm. just because, like, she causes so much stress. Um, so my husband had to kind of relay that information. Mm-hmm. And it didn't go over very well. My mom basically told my whole family that my husband is abusive and manipulative and keeping me from her. And so, like, no one is talking to my husband. And it's like, I just feel so horrible because I like, created this mess. And well, hold on. Whoa, 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 whoa. I'm going to challenge that hard. Is that cool? Yeah. Okay. You play no role in this. Your husband did exactly what he was supposed to do, which is stand between you and any sort of danger coming your way. Yeah. And that was your mom. God bless your husband, dude. Good for him. He stood down a dragon. And that dragon couldn't do anything to him because he's a strong man and he loves you. So she went and burned down everything else in the neighborhood. Yeah. Yeah. All of your safety nets, all your relationships, all the people you reach out to, his reputation, all of it. That is not you, Galen. You're separate from that. In fact, she's been trying to drag you underwater with her for years. Yeah. And you've kept fighting. Because that's who you are. You're so strong and you don't even see it. And then you married an amazing guy who will stand shoulder to shoulder with you and say, let's do this together. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So I want you to hear, I know how you feel. I trust you when you tell me how you feel. I'm asking you to trust me when I tell you how you feel is not reality. Reality is you're a very strong woman who 
um, is a core part of your husband's life or he wouldn't stand in front of the fire for you and vice versa, right? Mm -hmm. So when it feels heavy and dark, challenge that feeling because it's not true. I'm heartbroken that your mom treats you like this and treats him like this. It's truly heartbreaking. Yeah. So I called my mom um, last week or the week before um, and basically told her, like, this is not my husband. This is. Um, and I hadn't had, like, a conversation with her like this. So uh, I don't know. But I just said, like, right now you are causing me anxiety being around you makes me stressed out because I'm just so worried about your financial situation all the time. And I need to focus on getting better and healing right now. And so I need space from you. And it seems to go okay, but she keeps like messaging my husband. Like, I'm so sad. When can I see Kaylin again? Okay. But listen, this, I want to give you some context. This is bigger than money. Yeah. Your mom has used you for your entire life to prop her up, whether that was emotional, psychological, financial. And now she's trying to use you again to make her feel better because you're in the hospital. Yeah. That's insane. Your job in your lowest moments when you're hurting, when you're surrounded by medical care professionals, your job is not to make her feel better. She's a grown woman. That's her job and her community that she should have surrounding her. But she's used you as a life raft, and that was never your job. You were her daughter. Can I just tell you how out of this world proud of you I am for having that conversation with her? Thank you. Like that's a that's not a little win. So after you get out of this out of, out of of an involuntary hold, here's the goal: little wins. Yeah. Right. I want you just to shower yeah. today, and then you can get back in bed. Have you all had those conversations? I just want you to have one meal, and you get back in bed. Have you all ha walked through that? Yeah. Okay. And I'm actually back at work now too. So excellent, excellent. Slowly. Yeah. But a big win is. You calling the dragon and saying, hey, you are a pro part of this problem here. And I am going, I value my health and my body and my personality and my marriage so much that I am building a wall between us. Dude, that is, that takes a long time for someone to get the strength and courage to do that. I, I can't tell you how proud of you I am for that. It's amazing. Can you do me a favor? Yeah. Wherever you're sitting, will you stand up like real tall? Don't get up, but just like <laughs> put your back straight. Yeah. And I want you to like yeah. take your shoulders and clench them up real tight around your ears. Just do it for like two seconds. One, two, and then drop them. Like, you did that. <laughs> like for real. Yeah. And I know it hurt. And you hung up the phone and probably felt guilty and bad. And, oh, my gosh, what's going to happen? I'm so proud of you. Okay, so we're now we're back. And now my guess is your husband <laughs> is hovering over you like an umbrella. Like an Ella, Ella, Ella yes. umbrella. <laughs> yes. And I know it's because he loves me and he's worried. But it's, like, just constant, you know. Mm -hmm. Like, he's just so panicked that I'm going to do something stupid. And I get it. But Are you going to? It, it feels like a lot. I don't think so. Nope. That's not a good answer. Okay, no. Okay. Are you saying that just to shut me up? No. Okay. If there's any any crack in that concrete, he's going to do what he can to cover it up. As he should. Yeah. As any of us who love our wives would do. What y'all have to work through right now is the, the development of a plan that is ironclad that you will stick to and that he will stick to and that your medical professionals will stick to. What does that mean? I need you. You can text me four times a day. All these texts are stressing me out. But I also know that you love me and I love you and I need that connection. So we're going to agree to text four times a day. We're going to agree to yeah. 
SOS, skin on skin contact four times a day. Right when we wake up, we're going to stay in bed an extra two minutes and just hold hands and touch feet. Yeah. I'm going to, see what I'm saying? Like, we're going to come up with a plan mm -hmm. and we are going to, you especially, Kaylin, are going to stick to that plan like glue. Okay. And that's going to slowly, slowly <laughs> release his grip on, okay, she's safe. She's safe. The woman who I pledged my whole life to is safe. Now I can breathe too. Yeah. Right? Does that make you uncomfortable that he loves you that much? No. Okay. When you're in the black hole, though, you feel like mm -hmm. his life would be better if you were gone, didn't you? Yeah. Why is that? Okay. That's okay. Um, I don't know. I feel like I just don't like add anything to anyone. Like I don't like add value to anything. Okay. As I said earlier, I will, I will <laughs> honor the fact that that's your feeling. All of the evidence that you've given me is to the contrary. And it's important to remember this one thing. Feelings are not designed to tell us the truth. That's not their job. Their job is to keep us safe. Yeah. And so like when a soccer ball rolls into the street and my son goes to get it and I scream, you're going to die. He's probably not going <laughs> to die. But my job is to keep him alive, right? I have to tell him the truth in that yeah. moment. Similarly, that's your body's telling you like, hey, Here's somebody else who love said they love us. The last time somebody said they loved us, they were a vampire. They tried to take everything. And this guy sounds like he's for real. Is he for real? Yeah. So the next time you feel like you don't add any value, I want you to remember this conversation. And I want you to remember that guy who right now you are so annoyed that he is so close to you all the time because he loves you that much. Yeah. Do I have your solemn promise that if you ever get um, feeling like you want to hurt yourself again that you'll call somebody? Yeah. Say, I solemnly promise. I solemnly promise. Okay. You, you can't lie against a podcast or a YouTube show. <laughs> That's like uh, Cosmic or something. Okay. Okay. I think here, like in all honesty, the conversation goes like this with your husband. Um, I'm home for two weeks. I'm home for three weeks. I can tell you can't breathe, which then makes me not breathe, which, which then makes you not breathe. And so, yeah, this is our reality. And you look him in the eye and you hold both of his hands and you say, I will never hurt myself again, ever. And I want you to say it with conviction and mean it. And if you don't believe that, then you got to call your psychiatrist and your counselor right away. You promise? Yeah. Okay. I'm having a hard time believing you right now. <laughs> okay. Well, part of it is because it's hard when people say, like, hurt yourself. Because I don't know if you mean, like, self-harm or suicide or both. Both. Okay. Because you have to stop cutting too. I know. That, 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 that build up inside builds up and builds up and builds up. And that's that ultimate fatigue. I'm just done. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And can you tell I've had this conversation a whole bunch in my life? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you got to go sit with somebody and say, I want to stop cutting. Which in and of itself, I does not even get my heart rate up. That doesn't bother me. But when you attach that to this idea that um, I'm slowly kind of sort of ish practicing. 
And so if you're going to hurt yourself or if you're going to take your life, you have to make that call. Yeah. Everybody's life around you is an ash. If you're not here. Yeah, my counselor keeps telling me. Um, like I said, like I feel like all of this mess wouldn't have happened if I had just killed myself. And she was like, Kaylin, it would just be like a hundred times worse. What are you talking about? It would be infinitely worse. <sighs> infinitely worse. And I don't care about them right now. I care about you. You wouldn't be here. And my children would miss out on the contribution you're going to add to the world. I don't want that world. Okay? Yeah. And I know it doesn't feel like you add a contribution to it. That's where the work is. And so you hear me. Do you trust me? Yeah. Okay. So you hear me saying what I'm saying, and you don't feel that what I'm saying registers as truth. And I get that. Instead of being scared by that, say, huh, I got to figure out how to build a bridge to that because I trust that guy. Even when I don't trust me, I trust that guy. I trust my counselor even when I don't trust me. I trust my husband even when I don't trust me. So how do I build a bridge to get there? And that's what your counselor helps you do. And it's about learning some new skills. That's it. You got a toolkit and all you have in it is a razor blade and a bottle of pills, uh, right? Yeah. Yes. Cool. Let's get some new tools. Because the pain you feel is real. The home you grew up in was a chaotic mess. We're going to get some new tools. We're going to learn to exercise. And you're like, no. <laughs> yep. It has to happen. Or you can learn to go for a walk with your husband every day. You're going to learn to turn electronics off and not just spin out and spin out and spin out and spin out. You're going to learn to have people over to your house and hang out. They're just skills. They're not crazy things for crazy people who got talents that you didn't get. Just skills. What do you do for a living? I'm a teacher. Oh my gosh. You've learned that skill. <laughs> uh, what grade do you teach? I teach fourth. They're the best. <laughs> And did you know your room of 25 little fourth graders goes home to their parents every night and tells them how much they love Miss Kaylin? I think some of them do. <laughs> they all do. Even the ones that don't like you do. Because you know what some of them are going through in their homes. Yeah. And you know that some of them look in the mirror and don't like what they see. And you know what that feels like. And you know that some of them sit in that classroom and wish they could just disappear in their own seat and they can't. And that makes you, uh, that makes you the dream, dream teacher. I'm good at my job. <laughs> I know you are. I just want you to love yourself as much as those fourth graders love you. At least. Fair? Yeah. Fair. So you're not leaving me. You're not leaving those kids. You're not leaving your knuckleheaded husband who loves you so much. <laughs> And you've already taken the awesome first hard step of not leaving, but just separating yourself from people who hurt you. Cool. Yeah. And we're done with cutting. And we're going to find some alternative behaviors there. Okay. Okay. Yeah. You got no more reason to punish Kaylin. Kaylin's pretty awesome. Yeah. Cool. So let's make a plan with husband in a very detailed plan, almost like a fourth grade, like, like you would give to your fourth graders at eight o'clock is when we hug. And at 10, 15 is when I have a break and I will text you, tell you how much I love you. And at noon I will text you. And at this time I will text you and at dinner, we will do this. And if I end up cutting in my car out in the parking lot before school starts, my promise is I will call this counselor and I will call you. 
if I start feeling like I don't want to be here anymore and I'm going to take my life, I will call this person and I will call this person and I will call you. You have my solemn word promise. And we will begin to take a walk together before school starts and in the evening. And we'll get a dog and we'll fill in the blank. But y'all come up with a plan together so that he can exhale a little bit, which will allow you to exhale a little bit, which will allow him to exhale a little bit and takes all of the smoke out of your house. You just got to practice it. And I honestly recommend that y'all, you and him, go to your counselor and say, hey, we want to make a safety plan for our home so that we can all breathe in here. And your counselor will probably smile real big and say, well, I got you on that one. So, so, so grateful you're here, Caleb. You, again, call anytime. Call next week. We'll have you back on. So glad that you're here. We'll be right back. Hey, Dr. John Deloney here. I'm super jazzed to announce my new book, Building a Non-Anxious Life, is now available for pre-order. Listen, we all experience some level of anxiety or stress or burnout every day. But most of us don't know how to recognize it, let alone deal with it. And here's the good news. Anxiety doesn't have the last word. I know this because I've sat with thousands of you. And I know this because I've been there too. If you create a life of intentionally living out the six daily choices I've outlined in this book, you'll be able to better respond at whatever life throws at you. This book will help you learn practical steps to overcome anxiety. Plus, when you pre-order the book now, I'm going to give you something to help you today. That's why you'll instantly get my newest talk, Smoke, Fire, and Freedom, where I break down the misunderstandings and myths we believe about anxiety, how to reclaim your freedom, and how to build a non-anxious life. So pre-order Building a Non-Anxious Life today for just 20 bucks at johndeloney.com. All right, we're back as we wrap up today's show. We have, we're going back to the new segment, Am I the Problem? Yes. So we got our, uh, we got another one in. First of all, people, we need your emails in the subject line or right in the beginning. Type in, am I the problem? Send us your questions. Keep them fairly short. So we have time to do them. This person asked, am I the jerk? Am I the jerk? However you want to phrase it, fine with me. And then also make sure comment when we read this, we want to hear your comments. If you think this person's the problem. So comment, um, here, you know, in the comments or on the reviews. That would be great. All right. You ready? Let's do it. We moved into our house a little over a year ago, and our next-door neighbor closed on their house a week later and immediately poured concrete starting at 5 a.m., even before getting the okay from the HOA. She said she told the contractors not to start before the required 7 a.m., but was not there to supervise. We were just getting over COVID, and my infant daughter was awoken at the early hour of 5.30 a.m. I did post on a mom's group that I was looking for advice on how to approach my neighbor, and I did mention that I hated them. (laughs) <laughs> although i hated the act more than them but the exhausted state i was in i was mad uh, the daughter their daughter who does not live with them saw the post and recognized me when i went to go talk to the neighbor ever since we've had a contentious relationship with these neighbors they did install a fence without talking to us and expect us to pay half of it even though i found a better contractor with a better price I've tried to approach her on a couple of times about sharing the reasonable cost, but she will not even talk to me at all. Am I the jerk? Yes. Disagree. And feel free to disagree with me. I think it's yes and no. It's yes and no. It's yes on, you know, the stress of moving. Everybody knows the stress of moving and probably as a part of the stress of moving, there was some sort of built in. We have to do this to this property right away. We got dogs, chickens, whatever. Got to get a fence up. And, um, I was almost late to work yesterday. I have a huge, long, long, long driveway, like more than a quarter mile driveway that goes back into the woods and some painters from somebody else's barn. They're redoing their barn down the, down the, down the holler from where I live. They drove up. There's only one way in. So I got all the way to the bottom. I had to back my car all the way up this hill. Anyway, they made a mistake. They were just contractors getting to a job and want to get this thing done because they booked too many jobs. That's fine. Where I think she was wrong, where she was the jerk was, she didn't just go knock on the neighbor's door and say, or uh, number one, didn't just go, this is a one-time thing, dude. They showed up at 5 a.m. They're not going to pour concrete every weekend. If it was like a dance party, then yeah. But uh, dude, that's annoying. I'm going to go on about my day. That's annoying. They woke my daughter up and we were getting over COVID. Whatever happened. She went to the mom's group on Facebook where happiness and joy goes to die. 
just it's where courtesy and kindness and rational thinking goes up in flames. And then, so she created, I think, this relational like, ba-bam! And then it's really hard to come back. And now her neighbor's being unreasonable and moronic. I personally wouldn't pay for that fence. I just wouldn't. And until we sat down and have a conversation about it, I'm not going to pay for the fence. Because you went and just built a thing. You can't just charge me $5,000 for a thing that I didn't even ask for. It and You know what I'm saying? So, no, we got to have that. So she's being a retaliatory jerk. But I think it started with, I hate her. And, <laughs> come yeah. on, man. They need a reset. It's like she needs to just go over there and say, listen, this started off horribly. And that's my fault. I screwed I'm so this up. sorry. Yes. Can we just start over? With a gift basket. Yeah, and then if they don't, then, you know, there's not much you can do about it. But just kind of humble yourself, go over there and be like, I'm so sorry. Or as the great Taylor Swift says, I'm the problem. It's me. Let's start with that. And like a gift basket. And uh, I'm so sorry. Can we control alt delete this thing? And then if they go, no, we hate you. Well, then you've been the bigger person. Right, then you've got jerky neighbors. You've got jerky neighbors. And then you've got some choices to make. Yeah. Which is awful if you just bought this house. And you right. have an infant and you're trying to... Oh. Bad neighbors are just the worst. The worst. Just stuck. The worst. But also, if I had just moved into a house and I finally was able to coordinate the closing date and the concrete guys and the fence guys, and they went too early and somebody's already bombing me on the neighborhood Facebook page telling me they hate me, I would think, oh, great. I just moved in with terrible neighbors with no grace and no flexibility, no understanding for how complex all this is. So I think you started it. And when you start it, the only way this thing gets different is if you just take a different track. And if she wants to, <laughs> I can just imagine, hey, uh, can we talk about this, Vince? No, you hate me. Remember, you posted on, on the mom's Facebook page and stop having Facebook pages. Just go talk to your neighbors. Drive me crazy. Is that fair? I 100%. Joe, what do you think? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Definitely for civility <laughs> we, we, in the neighborhood. We call him Neutral Joe. <laughs> we call him Swiss Joe. He's like, whatever you just said, man. That sounds great. <laughs> sounds cool. All right. Hey, if you have a problem with your neighbor, just get all uncomfortable and anxious and nervous about it. And then let's go talk to him. Go talk to him. L give them an opportunity to not show up. And in so doing, you give them an opportunity to go, oh my gosh, I'm a person too. I'd love to help. Thank you for being with us today. Stay in school, don't do drugs, all that stuff. Be nice to your neighbors. Get off the Facebook pages. We'll see you soon.